Ah, right. I can uh, now uh, sort of start what will be, as uh, Al said, twin session. So uh, I'll start with the broader picture. And it's not going to be the dry doomsday scenario by any means. We, we have some of the uh, means to save ourselves in our own hands. And there's a few clarifications that we'll work in here. So the other thing we'll say is both between my paper and uh, the next paper, there's a lot more in the proceedings. Both slide sessions will only be sort of a dozen slides, 15 minutes each. So we will be skimming material, but we clearly the topic of the moment is 13 SEMs. There's plenty of other bands that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll no doubt talk quite a lot about 13 SEMs. Just to uh, <laughs> cover... The various hats I have. So in the UK, my uh, official uh, honorary officer title is for looking at the microwave band plans and the strategy for them. But uh, because I've led since the uh, passing of my predecessor, Mike Dixon, uh, some years ago, the initiatives for uh, modernisation and strategy on spectrum, I've since been elevated uh, not only to a, a deputy on the the IARU's Region 1 committee, and we'll explain what Region 1 is in a moment. But uh, above that, I'm now one of a very small study team looking worldwide at uh, what we might do as well in uh, all bands above 146. So uh, that's uh, an interesting study, which uh, it's overrunning a little bit at the moment, but we'll say a bit more about that. So that's a longer-term plan as opposed to some immediate things that we might actually want you guys to do. And uh, as uh, my other roles have an interest in uh, sort of teaching lots of amateurs and the standards and, what, and syllabuses for amateurs, EME doesn't get mentioned not only at sort of the entry levels in uh, amateur radio, it barely gets a mention even at the advanced levels of amateur radio. So whilst it's good to be with you all here, some of the messages in here is all about how to make EMI and other sort of really good parts of the hobby, much more visible and appreciated. And uh, for those UK amateurs uh, in the room, you can talk about the Olympics role, and that's me with a torch in October at the convention. That's a <laughs> I spent five years doing Olympics coordination, by the way, just for two weeks of sports. Right, so this talk is fairly brief and basically provides the backdrop to a bit later on. What we want to do is, uh, obviously, as a community, end up with frequencies that are harmonised and protected across all the countries. Now, some of them aren't too bad. 2.3 gigs is a right mess, and uh, sadly, some of the phones will be using them. <laughs> so <laughs> we need to transmit on that one and kill it. So the uh, conference proceedings are recommended reading. Now, uh, in EMI... The, uh, we've, uh, you know, whatever the frequency, it's uh, pretty bilateral from down on the ground up to the moon. And uh, the snag for a lot of us is that uh, all that central area are secondary bands where we don't get necessarily the priority with our uh, administrations, as we know. The, uh, these lower bands are the uh, particularly problematic ones because it's where we have most competition from one thing or another. In 2.3 and 3.4, it's mobile broadband. Down in 1.3, it's a more familiar, more historical sharing scenario. But uh, the advent of uh, more radars and new navigation systems, and the radars are increasing here because of wind farms, actually, which can't cope with interference further up the band, uh, make uh, even for that frequency uh, a bit of a challenge. 2.3, we'll uh, come on to. 3.4, we have a slide on later. As you know, 9 SEMS is a very good EMI band. This, there's good gradual progress in this band, even though other people are after it. So, mention Region 1, just to help you with the map. Region 1 is not just Europe. It uh, covers uh, the African countries, some difficult uh, Arabian countries, as well as uh, the Russians. And... Uh, if you ever look at the very top level, the, the, the ITU allocation tables, they have three columns. Whatever the frequency it is, none usually gets allocated across each region. And uh, for amateur radio, we organize ourselves the same way. So uh, 
uh, ARRL in some Central American countries uh, are in Region 2. The Australians and a few others are very prominent down in Region 3. The, uh, whoops, a bit too quick. So whilst uh, 2,300 to 2,400 continuous, all of it, is allocated to amateur radio everywhere, you may not realise it, and that's because local nations can still have their own rules provided they don't cause interference to the next nation, and that has been our first problem. The other thing is to just distinguish at the top level, the regulators decide you know, the, you know, the, the overall allocation, but within it, once you've got one, that's down to ourselves, and that's where uh, we also can uh, sort of have a bit of uh, evolution and improvement as well. The reason for the pressures on 2.3 and 3.4 is it's known as the sweet spot. Everything in the commercial sector pretty well is after that set of frequencies and a bit below, which is why the uh, TV community is being pressurised to release the top of UHF as well for fourth generation mobile uh, communications. Ironically, sometimes we want to see spectrum released. The more UHF spectrums released, the more white space devices will kill off PLT devices. So it's not always a case of it's always bad for us. Occasionally we need to look at the broader picture. In the uh, paper, I think I've got seven or eight messages. Some of them are very straightforward, common sense. I won't sort of labor them. But uh, one of the messages here is occasionally we actually need your help to help ourselves in the sort of the band planning and politics end of it. So uh, we often go to things and they say, amateurs, what do they do? Do they ever use these frequencies? And no matter what you think, no matter how good this conference is, our material out on the web, because the regulators will go into Google just like anyone else will, it's not always obviously visible. Likewise, where we've changed operating frequencies within a band over the years, that's not always percolated up to the VHF managers and the, your national band plans as well. So, uh, so outreach, publicity, it's got to be in a sort of coordinated manner. We were able to do a huge amount of work here around the 9 centimetre band because we got everyone to plant links to the same single web page, and you'll, you'll see that in a moment. So now, today... Anyone who looks up 3,400 megs will get our page first before any other operation. And that's very helpful. <coughs> so band plans do evolve over time. Make sure the feedback happens. So we had the discussion yesterday about the very bottom of 144. We, we knew anecdotally the bottom of 144 was pretty noisy, and that's why locally here, for other reasons, we took it out the EMA exclusive because EMA's migrated up band slightly. But uh, in other regions, no, some of those band plans are years and years out of date. We, as the bands narrow down, and they will be narrowing down, they're bound to narrow down, we, we need better information as to where your own operations are as well. In the paper, so I don't expect you to read this, what, uh, as per the paper's title, we've listed uh, you know, where things have been in the past, where they are today and where they might be going in future. So uh, here's, you know, 144's moved up 50 megahertz. We haven't mentioned much of six meters here, but we've had to relocate that because it's mainly JT-based and uh, was overlapping the CW operators. 2304, we know it's all over the place, but there's been past precedents. So 3456 in the States is uh, the EMI community helped by uh, my liaison with Peter ooh, a few years ago now, I think. We, we all moved to 3,400, which is good. But that left all the terrestrial operators there. Our liaison with the American band planners now shows that 3,456, for all intents and purposes, is a legacy frequency. And you should read into that, the fact that uh, there's a hint there. Consider moving the rest of your friends to 3,400 because uh, the broadband plans have 3,400, or 3,410, I should say, up to 3,600 continuous for future broadband as well, mainly for Pico sales. 5760, we just deal with the odd bit of uh, Wi-Fi and uh, not much change further up, other than, you know, again, we've got a situation where we'd like more people to be unified around 24048. 
in the Europe, no problem. Others are on 192. And, and these are important because we don't want to uh, wait for erosion. We want some of these frequencies freed so we can trade. One of the strategies that we'll be mentioning is to be proactive at this spectrum game and therefore assure our future before you know, it's too late. We've also had to introduce uh, locally, which uh, is more of a European thing but might be relevant, a so-called reserve frequency for either where the radars are or where a few countries are starting to lose access to 1296 because 1296 is within the Galileo and the GLONASS operations uh, allocations. The bottom of the land uh, is not. And uh, as the radars increase, 1296 used to be, certainly in the UK and other places, kept clear of radar. They used to be either side. The, the number, there's a number of new radars now that overlap that. So uh, I'm not saying we're reaching now, but ensure in any future band planning to think about you know, a bolt hole to have to go to one day. 13 SEMs, right, I've got one slide on this, I'm sure we'll hear a bit more later on. So, as I said, despite what your local experience may be, at the top level, it's allocated all the way up to 2450, including the Wi-Fi section and the amateur satellite section. But uh, some years ago, WRC, and I have to say, IARU was a bit slack, but wouldn't have had any power over this, couldn't stop it being designated, not allocated, to uh, the next generation of uh, mobile telecom. So 4G, LTE, all that sort of naming stuff is associated with this band. Years ago, people would have said, oh, it's WiMAX. Well, WiMAX is dead commercially. It'll be uh, more of this stuff. So at this very top level, if someone was to go to Geneva and say, oh, I need a new frequency, they'd say, well, you've already got it. But... You might say, no, I don't have. I've only got the bottom 10 megs, you know, like in the States, and there's a big gap in the middle. That's because, at the moment, there's a big mismatch between what the top level says and what our national situations are. These, re you know, restrictions or frequency sales are increasing. You know, it's not a trend we're going to stop. There's too much money at stake. So we need to look at where that's going and be ahead of the game. We've put in, in the European situation... Some very good amateur input, courtesy of a couple of colleagues, into the set, you know, the Region 1 situation. So it's not as though, even though we're secondary, we've been totally overlooked there. But uh, our problem has been that uh, some regulators just don't understand us or don't understand amateurs, and they would understand EMI even less, of course. So uh, if we're to survive, we've not only got to find a, a useful frequency, we need to address the fragmentation and uh, look at uh, the bits of the bands we've still got. And effectively, no, we can't claim to use all the frequencies. This thing about use or lose, we, we simply can't say we're using you know, hundreds of megs there and all the way up. We uh, need to come up with a solution where we uh, say to our regulators, we only need you know, a few harmonized megs for satellite, EME, etc. The other low-power stuff, we can fit around that, and we'll be less of a headache if you give us a long-term certain solution. And so the big question in Europe is, if we're going to move, where do we move to? We've looked at the very top edge of the band, not very interesting. 2320, the classic European frequency, will be fine in some countries in the short term. But uh, to be honest, when you look at the mobile band plan, the most protected part of it will be a guard band right at the bottom edge because it's, there's a space uh, research service band right at 2300. So just like 3400, we have to consider whether we jump to 2304 to immediately harmonise with the states but still be exposed or we drop even further into what will be a, probably a long-term guard band. The decisions that the regulators are doing over this aren't complete. So whilst my Swedish friends have run into trouble already... They've been a bit naughty and been ahead of the game. There's still several months of that process to go. Brief mention on nine SEMs, you can look at this web page. Region 2 and 3 technically have full allocations. In uh, Germany and Britain, traditionally, we had up to about 34.75, but we've already said in our own plans that we don't mind giving that away, provided we keep the bottom 10 megs. 
the bottom 10 NEGS is shared with military radar. That will not be changing and is therefore perfect cover for us to coexist. And this map has been getting greener year by year. Poland was on uh, earlier this year. I don't know if anyone's had an EMI expedition there, although the power's a bit modest. We just need a few more people to fill the gaps in. Our French colleagues are trying very hard, I know. They, hopefully they'll get one there one day. Mention that, ARRL, FSC will mention in a second. So uh, carrying on the messages fairly quickly, we've got to uh, be more visible. So it's not just using them, we've got to sh show that we're using them. We often have politics uh, over dominating the engineering, which is always a real problem. So we have to show the extra benefits. We'll, we won't compete on money. We need to show how this can inspire innovation, education, whatever it is, the so-called societal benefits. And we obviously rely on contact intelligence networking. So if a country suddenly has some new mad rule or regulator coming in that we don't know about, please uh, let us know. And, of course, keep the bands active. And we're, there's not many people who are good at this uh, combination of uh, spectrum management and technology and politics. So we're, certainly uh, we won't refuse you know, volunteers with the right connections, I can assure you. The, the team that's looking at the slightly longer-term structure, as opposed to some very immediate stuff, but it's already had an influence, is a thing called the Future Spectrum Committee. Well, that sounds a bit grand. It's actually a, a four-man study. The, the three reps is my, myself in Region 1. Brennan Price is the Chief Technical uh, Officer of ARRL and had an awful lot of work done on the National Broadband Plan. So Kent Britton in the audience here is uh, familiar with some of the very detailed work that's gone and happened in the States, very little of which has been published. In uh, Australia, Michael Owen, the Australian uh, Society President, nominated John Martin. So uh, the, the, the more adventurous strategies for addressing this have very much tended to come out of uh, our region and uh, the, the Australian side. But uh, when this work's uh, complete, it uh, will no doubt filter uh, down, but it's already having an influence on American and Canadian uh, replanning at the moment. And uh, in case you're wondering, where we start with is how to harmonize the narrowband Emian satellite allocations. Anything else short range like repeaters, TV links, what have you, no, you can locally fit that in, but clearly those are the key ones. And we also would like greater visibility. And here's uh, the uh, requirement or suggestion for the EMI community. Courtesy, I can blame this on, on uh, Brian Coleman, G4NNS, who uh, commissioned a project called Beacon Spot. Beacon Spot takes all the DX uh, reports on beacons being spotted across uh, Region 1 and wider in the case of 6 metres and plots them automatically on Google Maps or you can sell spot or the keepers can put their own spots in. If you take the same concept and plot the EMI stations on Google Earth and give them their location information, you should be able to... Uh, with Google Earth facilities, know when the sun's up, no, you get the moon position, and therefore you should be able to not only have it as a nice operating aid, it's much more visible and can directly run within a web page for others to look at. It's this sort of output that we use for beacons and other systems that was fed straight into the regulators to prove that not only do we use frequencies, but the propagation is a lot longer range than you know, the commercial people assume as well. So... Uh, it wouldn't take that much if you thought about it to try and come up turning my uh, vision here into a reality. I'd be very uh, pleased. And Brian can tell you more about how we did it with uh, EMI Spot. So in summary, before I uh, quickly hand over, there's no doubt it is a technical pinnacle, along with some other aspects, of course. Frequency managers, you know, directly on my job uh, remit, is to uh, promote and protect, but we can't do it single-handed. At times, we need your help to you know, provide us the material and the information and make it very visible and nicely visible. And uh, we, uh, as we've said a few times in here, and uh, given my own interest, it's not just the grey-haired folk in the room here. We want to inspire, protect and keep it and inspire the next generation as well. So please help me uh, 
to uh, help you guys. And with that, I'll quickly hand over to uh, our uh, sort of more detailed uh, one on 2.3. So, hopefully, it'll uh, sort it out. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Um, uh, now retired, since a few months ago, and uh, I no longer have at least direct access to the 32 meter dishes I used to be able to put on the air, so you see I'm down to a slightly smaller scale here. Uh, this picture is from my SM3 location, and uh, you may think that, well, okay, this is almost a perfect EME location. It looks peaceful, serene. Uh, low noise and all that. And that is true as far as it goes, uh, physically. But on the spectrum front in Sweden, things are definitely anything but serene these days. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm planning to tell you the story of the 13-centimeter band in Sweden from about the 1980s until today. And you will see what in the worst case may be in store, not only for us in Sweden, but for Swedish EMEers, uh, EMEers elsewhere in Europe and possibly for everyone in Region 1 and Region 2. But before we do that, I'm uh, just going to show this one slide uh, as a recap of uh, some of the things that Murray already told you about. And this is mostly for the benefit of those of you who are not already on the 2.3 gigs band because that band is designated by the ITU as a primary band for what is called the fixed service and the mobile service. That means military in many countries are using this band for their fixed links, which has been the case in Sweden for many years. In the US, of course, part of the band has been allocated to satellite broadcasting, and Sirius XM is well known to all our American colleagues and we know that it constitutes a bad source of interference to those who operate on 2320 from here. Now, 2400 to 2450 is, of course, full of license-exempt devices like uh, Wi-Fi, uh, all sorts of things like remote readout thermometers, uh, switching devices, and what have you. And in many countries, all or part of the band is also allocated to the amateur service I know there are a few isolated exceptions. I think there is actually a small segment, which is a primary allocation in the U.S., but it's high up in the band. But those amateur high-power allocations there are are unfortunately not coordinated between the ITU regions, and that is not for lack of trying. It's simply that alignment is impossible because of the national regulations in different countries. Okay, so before Y2K, or I should say uh, back in the 1980s about, the whole 2.3 to 2.45 gigahertz band was open for unrestricted amateur use in Sweden with a one kilowatt output power limit. Now, it says here in the year 2000, our p and lowered the general power limit to 100 milliwatts. Uh, for the background story, you should refer to my article. Um, I have done a bit more research and uh, I found out that it may even have happened earlier than that, possibly in 1996 sometime. But it did coincide in time with um, action by the P&T in Sweden. They simply decided to make amateur radio in general license exempt. <sighs> we thought that was a very good thing at the time. Now, uh, time has proven that that was not so, because making the service license exempt put amateur radio on about an equal footing with Wi-Fi, uh, car door openers, and what have you. It means that when push comes to show, you really have no legal status vis-a-vis uh, -vis the administration any longer. So you have to start from scratch. You have to build their confidence because you are not recognized as a licensed service anymore. Now, from that time, when the limit was lowered until about 2008, the P&T issued high-power permits to individual amateurs, and that was on a case-by-case -case basis. 
they always had to ask for approval for the individual cases from the Swedish Defence Forces because their links were considered as the primary service in the band and they had to be protected. Uh, now, those permits were worth one kilowatt at 2321. And the interesting thing is, during more than 10 years, there was not a single complaint of interference from the military. We actually had a very good collaboration with them. So this was sort of a formality that should not have been necessary. And in fact, in 2009, the Swedish National Radio Amateur Association, SSA, proposed to the PTS that we can take over the administration of these high power permits. And this was the first time that we realized that being a license exempt service is really no good. Because rather than reacting to this, the PTS suddenly started to reject all applications. And that happened at the beginning of 2010. And the reason given was that, quote, the ban was under consideration for reallocation. This was extremely ominous. Uh, actually, all of these decisions were sent out by registered letter. We had to go and sign for them at our local post offices. And when you started reading through it, it turned out that the motivations given were essentially boilerplate. <laughs> so we then started to dig into this, and it turned out that even the incumbent primary user, that is the military, had been told to move its fixed links out to the band. And it turned out that the primary reason for all this was that the PTS evidently had decided to start implementing the WRC07 decision to make the, this whole band available for IMT. And they were now clearing the band in preparation for auctioning it out. But the direct reason for them refusing to issue new high-power EME permits was found that in the midst of all this, they had also gone out and granted temporary permits to a video link operator company, which was considered as a primary service and therefore had to be protected on almost equal footing with the military. And we think that somebody at the PNT figured that, okay, just to uh, sort of eliminate all possibilities of getting an interference complaint from these video link operators that had just been granted a nationwide license and who could travel anywhere and start operating at any time, we'd better reject all the applications from the secondary user of the band, namely the amateurs. Now, digging further into this, it turns out that the 2300 to 2400 band has already been allocated for IMT in many countries in Southeast Asia. You can see China uses 2330 to 2380. There are others here, like Korea, two different sort of systems. Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Everyone seems to have chosen a different technology. There are guard bands. Uh, everything in black here is a guard band. So some of these allocations do contain guard bands as much as 10 megahertz wide. You might imagine that in a guard band like that, it should be possible to accommodate a few amateur uh, high power systems. And uh, the problem again is that not even the guard bands are aligned. So what happened then? in 2010 and 2011 was that PTS, at the end of the year, goes public with its plan to reallocate and sell the band. And that was very late in the game. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, two slides ago that the rejection of the amateur applications should really have followed some sort of advance notice directed to the National Radio Amateur Association, that is SSA. But SSA never heard a word about it until the thing was a fact. And that was probably also a result of amateur radio no longer being a licensed service. But when this came out, there were strong comments supporting a continued amateur allocation in the band that were submitted by SSA, and also by the Swedish National Ursa Committee, which is affiliated with the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. Uh, 
I guess I, I must admit that this was probably because I happen to be a member of this committee. Uh, I'm actually chairing uh, the Section G, Ionis Parrot Radio. So I managed to get the support of that, and I think uh, eventually that was extremely helpful. And IRIU Region 1 submitted their own support for a continued presence in the band. And after all that had been done, there were intermediate level contacts taken with, mm, from the SSI to the PNT, and the SSI also started to talk to the video link people. And eventually all this led to a situation where the video link company accepted that, okay, you amateurs are probably not a big danger. So we accept that the PNT can submit your applications to us for review. And if we can say, okay, then we have no further objections to you continuing operating in the band at least temporarily. And all this resulted in several Swedish EMEers actually being issued with extended high-power permits in early 2011. And the new thing here is that we actually got a small slice down at 2304 as well, which Sweden hadn't had for more than 10 years. And at that time, I finally became QRB on the band. Then about a year later, when we thought that things were going in the right direction, there was something different that happened. Again, completely unexpected. Now, a different department inside the PNT had been asked to do a total revision of the table of frequencies and frequency bands allocated to license exempt services, one of which is amateur radio. And when their findings were published for public comment, it was proposed that the entire 2.3 to 2.45 gigahertz band amateur allocation would be removed. And this is a rather amazing statement. According to information from radio amateurs, the band is hardly used at all today because of the low power limit. Thus, the administration evaluates the effect of removing the amateur service allocation as minor. If I ever saw a catch-22 in amateur radio, this must be it. <laughs> but this is even worse. The amateur radio service in the band was described as, quote, an obstacle to the future allocation of the band to mobile broadband services needed in order to improve the competition in the marketplace for the benefit of the consumer. So you can see that at least in Sweden, frequency management is nowadays strongly market-driven. And it's not just us amateurs that suffer from that. Uh, even ISCAT, an international scientific organization using high-power radar to investigate the ionosphere, uh, the troposphere, and climate change, has lost its frequencies in the 900 megahertz band because Sweden and Norway both had to ratify an ERU, this, uh, actually it was a European Commission uh, decision to implement 3G services in the 900 megahertz band called UMTS 900. This happened about two years ago and made half of the ice kit systems unusable. So, <coughs> of course, one had to do something drastic about this. And in early 2012, there was crash action by SSA the Ersi Committee and others to prevent the total loss of the band. The argument was that PTS had shown no objective justification for removing the upper part of the band, 2400 to 2450, and therefore that should be retained under all circumstances. And now I think I have to speed up. Uh, on April of this year, PTS actually published a summary of all the comments that had been received to this latest revision of the frequency table. And in those comments, well, or rather in their evaluation of them, the authority admits to having no objective reason for withdrawing that part of the band. So that will be retained, but still only with the general 100 milliwatt power limit. 
and it may still be possible to get high power permits on a case by case basis. That was actually spelled out in there. But we still don't know exactly what this means. The worst part of the course is that in the 2304 and 2320 segments, we can expect extremely bad interference from IMT based stations when and if these ever become established. Um, I'm afraid I don't have time to go through all of the computations I made, but I should show you one late-breaking and happy news. They have actually issued prolonged licenses, prolongations valid until the end of this year. So always look on the bright side of life. We can be active for another six months. <laughs> Legal. <laughs> but if we must coexist with IMT, will we be able to hear anything at all? And that depends on a number of things, like the IMT base station IRP levels, their spectrum masks, and their out-of-band emission levels. Whether or not there will be guard bands between the IMT channels and the diversity scheme employed. One would have wished for FDD, but I'm afraid that is out of the question now. This particular slide is largely overtaken by events. The only thing that is on the table today is TDD, DLT. And I wouldn't spend long on this. Uh, it's a much too crowded slide, but the important thing to show here is that TDD, which stands for time division uh, duplex, or time division diversity, if you wish, means that uplink and downlink will be on the same frequency. Everything will be time sliced. The subframes here will be exactly one millisecond long. So to the extent that the TDD LTE station will use the full capability, you will have a one kilohertz rattle over all over the band. And that will also be heard between the frequencies and probably all the way out into the guard bands. So the minimum requirement, I think, is that there has to be a sufficiently high isolation or attenuation between an LTE base and an EME system to avoid driving either receiver into nonlinearity. But more importantly, the LTE off-channel emissions must be at or below the EME receiver floor. And of course, very importantly, the LTE channel cannot overlap an EME band because then we won't hear a thing. This is about what you can expect. This is actually suggested by Ericsson. You can imagine that much of what is happening in Sweden now is probably driven by wishes raised by the Ericsson Corporation. Uh, that's my personal guess. I don't have any proof for it, but anyway. We're talking about a power density of plus 50 dBm per megahertz, or a peak power in the order of plus 64 dBm, which is 2.5 kilowatts. That's a lot of power. My example calculation tells me that at the one kilometer distance, assuming a typical EME dish with only the side loads looking at that LTE base station uh, and an unobstructed line of sight view of the base station, the worst case pickup could be as much as minus 8 dBm. And that, of course, is more than enough to drive your second stage preamplifier into nonlinearity. So, to handle that, you would first of all need extremely sharp filters between the first and second stages. But on top of that, the all channel LTE emissions will be done, they will be seen at about minus 177 dBm per hertz. And that translates to an additional about 145 Kelvin of noise. Okay. Which is equivalent to reducing your receiving sensitivity by a full six decibels relative to a typical system that has about 50 Kelvin of noise temperature. So in summary, it looks as if we are indeed going to lose the 2300 to 2400 part of the band in 2013. But thanks to the dedicated work by the SSA executive and strong support from a number of other uh, groups and associations, we have been able to keep the upper 50 megahertz. It may actually be possible to obtain high power permits for EME also in the future. But once IMT networks start to be deployed, we do not know if it will be possible to receive EME signals any longer. And TDE LT will be a very difficult case. And I just want to suggest this. 
if you should find yourselves in the Swedish situation, some of you will very soon. I'm sorry to say that, but I'm afraid some of you will find yourselves in this situation very soon. Do work through your National Amateur Association and its frequency managers, because those are people that have long established connections to your National Spectrum Administration. And through that, all the way up to the ITU, they can actually be uh, admitted to international frequency conferences all the way up to the ITU general conferences as observers. And these people also have the right connections to the IRU. You should present the EME case to these people and brief them until they understand the specific problems of EME. You should ask them to bring that problem to the attention of your administration in a constructive manner. And you should help them out with modeling, ghost writing, and whatever. But what you should never do is to go straight to your administration as an individual, because that tends to do much more harm than good. But while the band is there, use it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Goodman, and, <laughs> and Murray as well.